Papa. Um, Got it. Uh, the, the Dean of uh, North Prince George's, we're so glad to see you all. If you look over in the chat uh, side of your screen, you'll see a few instructions. So as, as you sign in, if in the chat, you'll please share with us your name, your congregation, uh, whether you are clergy, a delegate to convention, or a warden, and then also something going on in your congregation that you're feeling grateful for. And we'll give it another minute or so, and then we'll get rolling. Hey, Deborah, William. Hey, Emma. Uh, just a minute. I'm fooling around with my computer. <laughs> All good. <laughs> Let's see. Hey, Linda. Hi, Bob. Hey, Mary. I don't know what's going on here. I'm trying to see. I may have to come okay. back in. Hey, Todd. Hey, Robert. All right, um, Alan, I guess if we could put up the first uh, slide, which has our agenda and meeting guidelines, and we can get started. All right, if you haven't already, if you'll please uh, type your name and parish into the chat along uh, with whether you're a clergy person, a warden, a uh, delegate to convention, and anything that's going on in your church uh, that you're feeling particularly grateful for these days. We'll ask you to please stay muted unless you're called upon. If you have any questions or comments as you listen to what's being said, if you will please type those questions or comments into the chat. And then if we have anyone joining us by phone, if you will please dial star nine to indicate that you have a question. If everyone could please put themselves on mute. Thank you. Now, and we can go to the next slide, please. Our agenda for the, the evening is uh, to your left. We'll begin with a prayer uh, followed by some opening remarks by our Bishop. We'll have about 20 minutes or so with our reparations committee, followed by about uh, 20 minutes of a presentation of our 2024 draft budget, in which case you'll uh, be invited to offer comments and ask any questions that you might have. We'll take a break for 10 minutes after that. And when we come back from our break, we will gather with our regions. So North Prince George's uh, County will be in uh, one breakout room. South DC will be in another. We'll come back together after those conversations, hear any parting words from our bishop, uh, and then close together in prayer. Next slide, please, Alan. So let's begin. Let us pray. This is from the Book of Common Prayer. Oh God, by your grace, you have called us in this diocese to a goodly fellowship of faith. Bless our Bishop Mary Ann and all of our clergy and all of our people. Grant that your word may be truly preached and truly heard, your sacraments faithfully administered and faithfully received. By your spirit, fashion our lives according to the example of your son and grant that we may show the power of your love to all among whom we live. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Milana, I'll pass it over to you. I'm going to bring you portions of Isaiah 35. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who are of a fearful heart, be strong. 
do not fear. Here is your God. God will come with vengeance, with terrible recompense. God will come and save you. Then shall the eyes of the blind be open and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer and the tongue of the speechless sing for joy. For waters shall break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool and the thirsty ground springs of water. The haunt of jackals shall become a swamp. The grass shall become reeds and rushes. No lion shall be there, nor shall any ravenous beast come up on it. They shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. As we hear these images of the land, I invite you to imagine with me that you grew up and have lived in a place far away in time and in distance, and that where you lived, it was always one climate. Week after week, month after month, one kind of temperature and weather, cold and dry and monotone. Imagine living in such a place and then coming to DC and Maryland to the mid-Atlantic in January. And if you came in January to our region, it would be cold and dry and barren and brown. And since you always have known one kind of thing around you, you would think that that's all there was. That it would be like that for always. But in our area, there is spring. And so someone coming from such a place would be astounded to see after a couple of months, things coming up out of the ground, like crocuses that the passage mentions, and blossoms coming out on the trees, and leaves and tulips coming up. And after a while, there would be beauty where you had no idea that such a thing could exist. All around us now in our world, there is dryness and barrenness and destruction. There is that which is so painful and so difficult everywhere we look around the world. But this passage from Isaiah, talks about God's ability to change what looks like that into something very different. This passage talks about the God who has underneath the ground the bulbs, has underneath the ground the tubers, and has within the dry gray branches the capacity for life and blossom. And if the land around us, if what's happening around us sometimes looks like there can be no change. As for some of our sisters and brothers around the world who live with such constant abuse or poverty, such constant cold or lack that they can't imagine anything different still. Here our scripture speaks of God who transforms. It's our God who brings from a brutal execution, resurrection, and even brings salvation out of that. So I invite us all to consider these images in this text of 
dry, barren ground cracked up and sand and desert and howling winds and uh, forces that smell sulfurous and evil, forces of destruction. And to know that whereas all of that may be around us right now, and we may not be able to see underneath, our God is the one who promises transformation to these things out of God's own loving power. So we see what we see, but God has promised what God has promised. And that is what's coming. Thank you so much, Milana. Bishop, we gladly pass it over to you. Um, thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm just going to toggle back and forth between the two screens on my computer so I can see you. And I'm glad to read all of the names that are in the chat. Very, very happy to be with you and um, and to, I just want you to know that um, in preparation for tonight, I, I spent a significant chunk this afternoon um, thinking about and praying for the congregations that represented in these two regions. You, some of you may know I keep these big maps of the diocese in my office and I look at them every day, um, thinking about and praying for people that represent us. And I wrote down the names of each one of your faith communities, um, including the one that um, is uh, sort of coming into being once again in Bowie. And I wrote down some of, the, some of the things that I know about you and your leaders and your communities, um, your people. Um, and I took the time to give thanks to God for you um, and to pray that you might be blessed with some of the things that Milana pro you know, spoke of and that the passage from Isaiah uh, promises. Most of all, that... Um, through everything that you have an abiding sense of God's presence and love for you amid all the joys and sorrows and opportunities and challenges that are the stuff of congregational life. <laughs> um, and, I, and I know that you've all been through a lot in recent years. I mean, we all have. Um, and collectively, we're, you know, we're holding a lot right now. Um, there's a lot of diversity. Uh, uh, this is a very diverse couple of regions, both in terms of your uh, particular demographics in your congregations and the regions, the geographic regions in which you live and move and have your being. And so there isn't one narrative that could hold or define um, any one of us, but together there is this mosaic of what it means to be the Episcopal Church in our region and um, in our time. And in my 12 years as bishop, I've been going, I've been actually going through all of my files of each visit of each congregation that I have in my computer. And in my 12 years of bishops, I've made four and in some cases, five official Sunday visitations to the 86 churches in the diocese, including yours. I spent time with you in many other contexts and gatherings. And, um, and I, I just want to, um, just acknowledge again, um, the diversity and the range of congregational life and experience that's represented here. Um, and what I wanna say, and I, I'll be brief, I don't think I'll um, take all the time allotted for me tonight. I, um, I often encourage the clergy and diocesan and staff leaders um, in the diocese to, to think of their ministry using the image of an arc and to ask the question where any of us is on that arc of our lives or of a given season in life of ministry and similarly true for a congregation and in this case you know for regions and the diocese and so i was um, i've been pondering that as well and and um, as a diocese among other things we are in the 12th year of my my episcopate and as i've said before the 15 year mark will will be a, a significant turning, most likely the time when the standing committee and I will call for the election of my successor, um, which is a couple year process. So it's uh, it'll take some time, but I think that's coming. And 2024 is also, the you know, next year is also the fourth year of what is now, once was a five year and is now a six year strategic plan. 
a plan that had very grounded and yet aspirational goals that we established in 2020. And so if you think about it in terms of those two arcs, one thing we might say about where we are, where we are in the overlapping arcs of my Episcopate and of the strategic plan is something akin to the seventh inning stretch of a baseball game. Um, in other words, we've got some time. Time we've, we've done a lot of things. We've been about a lot. Um, and it's time to assess and take stock of our collective efforts so far, where we've been fruitful, where we haven't, what we've been learning, what's happened in the first, first four years that we didn't anticipate and how we've adapted so that we have we can spend these next two years as fruitfully and as strategically as possible. And I think all of diocesan convention in 2024 will be about that kind of taking stock and uh, reporting and evaluating and then setting, uh, re reestablishing uh, the arc as we imagine it um, for the next year into this, for the next two years. Um, and so that's that's the way that uh, I am, am thinking and have been encouraging the Dawson staff to think. That's the way the different committees and the working groups of the diocese around the key diocesan initiatives of, of revitalization, uh, Christian education and leadership and equity and justice. I'm asking them to, we'll be asking them to think about and prepare us uh, to be poised for that, for that kind of clarifying and honing an arc. And the one piece that I'll put before you tonight that is on my heart to bring to that conversation, and I think will, um, at this point, I'm pretty sure it's going to inform our gathering on Friday evening, hopefully as an encompassing uh, question, but also uh, a, a focused one. And it has to do with something that we learned in the, in the, in the year or two, excuse me, in the year or two leading up to the strategic plan itself, when we were going around the diocese and talking to people. And one of the things we heard over and over again from people, I mean, we heard a lot of things, but this was a constant theme, that as the Episcopal Church and as Episcopalians in our diocese, um, there was a sense that we are clearer about the things that we question in our faith and the things that we don't believe than we are about the things that we actually do or the path of discipleship that makes the Episcopal church what it is. And we've spent, you know, and, and the presiding bishop has spent a lot of energy on this and, and thanks to him, we have this very compelling image of Jesus's way of love and the practices of a Jesus focused life. Um, and one of the things that I'm hoping we can dwell a bit on as we move into 2024 are the ways that congregations have been learning and practicing what we might call um, their path of discipleship. How do the congregations understand um, and live out what it means to be a follower of Jesus? We have a lot of diversity and we have a few congregations that are making some real strides in that area. And it might be really fun and interesting to spend dedicated time thinking about that and exploring ways we might encourage one another to go deeper. And so the question that I'm, I'm batting around and, and just maybe testing out with you tonight is, what if we focused on uh, Friday night on the question that, um, that Jesus asked his disciples kind of at the seventh inning stretch of their ministry when things were really, you know, picking up and gaining some momentum and they were on their way to Jerusalem and there were crowds and there was a lot going on. And you may remember he pulls them aside and he first he asks the question, you know, well, what are you hearing? Who do the people say that I am? And then he asks that other question that every follower of Jesus um, in some ways has to struggle with for all of our lives, which is, well, and what about us? What about you? Who do you say that I am? And so um, I invite you to ponder that. I invite you to be in touch with me if there are things in your congregation that are particularly compelling that you are learning and, and uh, experimenting with or, or trying on or clarifying, 
We're going to do some gathering of stories from around the diocese and maybe put uh, one or two things in motion in a collective way next year so that we can um, gather up all that we are doing as a diocese and come to see that as our path, um, the way that Jesus has uniquely called us, uh, both in love and in sacrificial service and in um, fulfillment of our life's joy in being in being followers of Jesus. So that is my, those are my reflections for tonight. Um, and I'm happy to, um, I, I don't think this is a time for like questions from the floor, but um, I'm also happy to take any questions or comments, certainly in the chat as you, um, if you like, or, or you can be in touch with me via email or, you know, really any time, because I'd love to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Bishop. We're now going to turn to a couple of representatives from our, our reparations committee who will share with us a presentation for the next 20 minutes or so. Thank you. If you could put the slide deck up. Okay, awesome. Hello, everyone. My name is Gigi Nelson, and I come to this work as a layman with over 30 years as a historian and as a genealogist. I want to start by saying that I know that there is a lot of feeling and a lot of thoughts, a lot of emotion around the direction that the diocese is moving in regarding reparations. But we are all one family. The Episcopal Diocese of Washington is one family. So I wanna speak very plainly to you like family, no sugarcoating, no whitewashing, no pun intended. Um, but critical examination can be a hard thing. It can come as a shock to liberal white institutions. And let's be real, the Episcopal Church and this diocese are more or less liberal white institutions. And the modern history that we as a church like to point back to is that Edal stood with their black brothers and sisters in the civil rights movement. And that's not revisionist history, it absolutely did happen. We all know that Martin Luther King Jr. preached his last sermon at the National Cathedral on March 31st, 1968 on the eve of his Poor People's Campaign. And he was invited to speak there by the Dean of the Cathedral, Francis Sayer Jr. So yes, Edow has been an ally at certain points and we absolutely acknowledge that. But this is 2023 and this is where we are right now, grappling with the question of how Edow has been complicit in and or has benefited from slavery. Critically examining the legacy of white supremacy, institutional racism, anti-black bias, and a host of other things that don't make the party fun. Some of you may be completely against reparations in any form. Some of you are fine as long as it doesn't involve money. Some of you may think that it should only be about money. Some of you are 100% on board with whatever the diocese does or just tired of talking about it. Some of you may be advocates, but your parish isn't or vice versa. Some of you may be unsure of exactly what's happening or why and don't know whether you should support it or not. So we want you to know that wherever you are on this journey, that it's okay. You have a right to your feelings. They are valid. I want to be really clear. I love Episcopalian tradition. I love its rituals. I love the liturgy and all its forms. High church, low church, I'm here for all of it. I'm not a cradle Episcopalian. This was a conscious choice that I made in 2019. There are so many great things about this diocese, so many wonderful things that we can be proud of and should be both at the diocesan and at the parish level. But we can't let our pride in our Episcopal heritage blind us to the fact that this family has some fractures in it, some open wounds that as much as we might wish they had, have never really healed. And it's just time out for pretending otherwise. And this isn't to say that other groups or other ethnicities have not been harmed in this church. There's been enough to go around. But over time, it seems like it's become easier or more palatable to discuss the plight of quote unquote marginalized people everywhere and sort of bury the very specific issues around the impact and legacy of slavery. And that is something that we have to drag into the light and just deal with. I wanna be really clear again, this is not about blame. We're not trying to embarrass or humiliate anyone or make anybody feel bad especially if your family was one of those that did benefit economically from slavery. It was what it was. Our job is to speak truth with love. And so that's what we have to do as a family and call it exactly what it is so that we can deal with it. 
this baby is not cute. White supremacy, racial discrimination, bigotry, systemic injustice, historic black economic exploitation, reparations. These are not warm and fuzzy subjects. And no, most people don't feel great talking about them, which is probably why it's taken so long to really address this in ways that are meaningful and not just symbolic or performative. But the time is now, not to denigrate or sit in judgment, to be, but to begin to heal the family. Now, you might be wondering why there is a Sankofa bird on this slide. The word Sankofa literally means to retrieve, but the meaning of Sankofa is more broadly expanded upon in an Akan proverb that says, it is not taboo to go back and fetch what you forgot. The power of Sankofa centers around this, to know history and your heritage is to know your current self, the world around you, and how to better both. Yeah, I do tend to talk fast. It's I've always been that way, but I'll go, I'll try to slow down a little bit. Okay. In this context, in this work of reparations, we are going back and uncovering, lifting the veil, you might say, on Edal's racial past. Some of that past might be great, some of it might be neutral, and some of it might be mildly shocking to truly horrific. Some of you might look at it as ancient history, long dead and best forgotten. But some members of this body, this family, whether the community, parish, or actual individual, Edal's past may have had an outsized negative effect that continues to this day, and unless and until we take concrete steps, could continue into the future. Okay, next slide. So this is our agenda, what we're going to be talking about today. So basically a timeline of events, diocesan resolution, um, basically kind of how we got to where we are now and what we're doing and what we're planning to do, and then conclusions. All right, next slide. So we begin with our land acknowledgement and the understanding that all of us, whether our ancestors intentionally settled here or brought here as indentured servants, kidnapped to become slaves or who migrated at a later date are on land that was originally home to several Native American tribes, most of whom were completely wiped out within several generations of European colonization, some of whose names we know and others who have been lost forever. Then we have our personal verses for today. This first verse tells us that God gave each of us a ministry of reconciliation. As far as I know, it's the only ministry that God gave to each and every person that calls themselves a Christian. He calls us to love, which should not be optional, but he gave each of us the ability to reconcile. James 5, 4 tells us that the wages themselves are crying out from the ground. This is a very powerful image. And then the last where God tells us that he wants his children to be reconciled to each other. This is so important to God that he'd rather us postpone our worship of him to make things right. That is a really powerful concept. Okay, next slide, please. You could pick a date for when the call for reparations began from before the Civil War to right after it ended to 1969 when James Foreman went to Riverside Church in New York and delivered his Black Manifesto, which made the case that white churches should pay reparations for Black enslavement continuing discrimination and oppression. You might not have liked his methods, but his actions did spark a nationwide reckoning of the larger Christian church's relationships with businesses that were built by slave labor. And so sometimes the mode or the messenger becomes the focus instead of the actual message because people let themselves become offended at the way that it's delivered. For our purposes, we'll say 2006 at the 75th Episcopal General Convention when a resolution was passed condemning slavery. Fast forward to 2015, and this you can read this piece of the resolution on the slide. Then in 2017, or sorry, the 2017 framework for the Episcopal Church's work toward racial reconciliation, healing, and justice. According to the website, it is, quote, guided by the long-term commitment to becoming beloved community. The Episcopal Church organized ministries around the four quadrants of that labor, and each quadrant representing a commitment that is vital to lasting change within us, our churches and our communities, and society at large. And those four pillars are telling the truth about the church and race, proclaiming the dream of beloved community, practicing Jesus's way of healing love, and repairing the breach in society and institutions. In 2021, the Theology Committee of the House of Bishops published a report on reparations and beloved community, that committee's job was to advance the cause of beloved community, and they discovered pretty fast that the biggest issue to that was white supremacy. 
Okay, next slide. So it's human nature to be okay with historical silences, but when you know better, you have to do better. So with the Episcopal Church's call to tell the truth, the Episcopal Diocese of Washington took up the work. And Edal's working definition of reparations says that reparations is the spiritual and material process to remember, restore, reconcile, and make amends for historical and continuing wrongs against humanity that can never be singularly reducible to monetary terms, but must include a substantial investment and surrender of resources. So we took our cue from what came out of General Convention and starting with the Diocesan Reparations Task Force, and you see the members of that task force on this slide here. Their work encompassed two research initiatives, and at the end of it, they created a video report. That video also invited parishes from across the diocese to research their histories and tell their stories, and we'll talk more about that later. Concomitant to the Reparations Task Force was the Black Ministries Task Force, headed by Reverend Ricardo Shepard, and in 2021, they published a report that had many similar themes. Next slide, please. In 2022, the diocese held a symposium called Repairing the Breach and representatives, probably most of you, um, from across the diocese came together in person and online to reckon with our diocesan history of participation in anti-Black racism and to learn more about the legacy of benefit the diocese has received from that participation or that complicity as the case might be. Then in 2023, in January, the diocese passed this resolution and it basically took the recommendation of the task force and created a new diocesan committee on reparations. And that task force was dissolved, but many of the people involved in it are also on the committee now. The new committee would be composed of two groups, a policy working group and an education working group. Next slide. So you see here the members of the policy working group chaired by Reverend Glenna Huber of Epiphany and Ms. Erica Gilmore of St. George's DC. And this group will research other institutions that are navigating reparations and learn best practices to develop proposals on ways that EDAL can approach reparations. Next slide. The education working group's stated goal, and I don't know if I mentioned that I'm the chair of, of this particular group, but the education group's working stated goal is to help educate the diocese on its history so that we can understand how we got to where we are today. And again, the purpose is not to dig up dirt or point fingers, but just to be transparent about the whole history, even the unpleasant or downright terrible part so that we can work through them as a family and engage in reconciliation on our way to becoming beloved community. We cannot even begin to hope to heal until we address the impact of slavery, white supremacy, and the systemic inequity of the church. And I just wanna say here that inequity is not the same as inequality. I'm 5'5". Five five. If my six foot four friend, AJ Wilson, and I are trying to see over an eight foot fence and you give each of us a box that's two feet high, then she's good. And we're equal. We have the same size box, right? But I still can't see over the fence. So I'm going to need a bigger box. That is equity. And no, I don't really know AJ Wilson. Um, two time MVP player for the Las Vegas Aces, for those of you who don't follow women's basketball. She actually attended an Episcopal um, school in South Carolina, where she's from. But anyway, all right, next slide. So then we have our ex officio members and our staff liaison. Um, the policy group is also going to have an advisory board, and they're developing that board now. So we do want to acknowledge that the diocese cannot right all the wrongs of its past. That would be impossible. But what we can do is make an honest and unflinching assessment of where we've come from, what we've done or left undone and do the best we can to change some of the negative trajectories so that our future as a family on earth more closely resembles the kingdom of heaven. As someone said recently, quote, C.S. Lewis nailed it. We cannot go back and change the beginning, but we can start where we are and change the ending. Next slide. So your feedback is super important to us. And so during this presentation, um, feel free to put your questions in the chat or if you want to come off mute and ask the question, or sorry, answer the question, um, or give your comments or whatever, you are welcome to. Um, so the first question is, what are your thoughts about my explanation of our reparations committee? And was there another way that you thought this committee would be structured or that you thought it should be structured? Does anybody have any? Let me see if I can check all the, the pages to see if anybody has their hand up. 
if you have your hand up and I don't see it, um, feel free to just come off mute and ask your question or make a comment. Okay, well, I'm gonna take that to mean that I did a really fantastic job of explaining the reparations committee, so yay me. All right, next slide. So what have we accomplished so far? Um, we developed an email survey to send out to each parish in the diocese in August, just sort of gauge where you are and your parish are at in terms of anti-bias training. And again, this wasn't something to point fingers or judge, but just to get an honest assessment and a sense of how and where you see the intersection of race and justice in your parish. Then we followed that up with a phone survey for people that we didn't hear back from. So if you got a random call or three from somebody named Gigi, that was me. All right, um, a couple of quick statistics for this group. Um, for North Prince George's and South DC, the response rates were super high. So thank you all so much for taking time out. Um, we were told over and over that everybody was busy. It was summer and we did, we, so I, I had very, not that I had low hopes, but I, I was I was pleasantly surprised by the response rate. So in South DC, we had nine out of nine respond. And in North Prince George's County, we had eight out of nine parishes return the survey. Um, some statistics from the diocese overall, so this is data from every parish that did participate. As it relates to worship, 74% of congregations have reviewed the elements of their worship, um, music, prayers, iconography, through the lens of race and representation. When it came to educational opportunities for adults and children, 65% of congregations have hosted formal educational opportunities on racism in the past six years. Um, only 5% of congregations had anti-racist educational opportunities for children. For parish policy, 24% of congregations have established policies to promote racial equity, um, things like in their hiring practices, contract set-asides, or reparations. 21% of parishes have undertaken researching their history through the lens of race and racism, and 8% have plans to undertake this research within the next two years. So there's definitely been some momentum, but we also definitely have some areas of opportunity as a diocese. The other thing that we've done is um, we have a new reparations page on the EDAO website. So if you type in EDAO reparations, it'll pop up, you'll see all of it. Content's been updated and expanded, so you can find a very comprehensive list of EDAO and Episcopal Church resources, among other things. We have so far published six articles in the EDAO bulletin. They're also available on the website in both English and Spanish. Um, from here on out, we'll be publishing one article a month um, along with occasional features. And the next article is actually planned for December and it's a spotlight on parish history work in general and the St. Columba story in particular. We've also kicked off a social media engagement or we will shortly. We are working with EDAO um, to, to make that happen. And so uh, EDAO will feature a post each week from the reparations committee on Mondays and the regular posting will begin in November. Next slide. So here's another opportunity for feedback. Okay, now I, let's see. Um, I see a question in the chat and it says, what is the status of reparations related to HBCUs? Oh, oh, the Episcopal Church's um, HBCU, I guess, St. Augustine. Oh, and locally, regionally, and nationally. Okay, so, so we're really focused on, on EDAO, not necessarily, you know, the larger Episcopal church. So I don't necessarily have an answer for that. If anybody in the, in the audience does, you're welcome to come off mute and, and respond. But um, yeah, if you want to, I can, yeah, I, I don't really know, sorry. My one question. <laughs> Anyway, um, did any, I, let me see. Did anyone? Did this, this, this is Bishop Marianne. I, I think um, it's a great question. Um, all I can say is that I know it is and has been a strategic priority of the presiding bishop to um, to examine and to um, re renew um, a sense of clarity and mission around the Episcopal HBCUs. But that's all I that's all I can say. I just know that. There on the national or on the the Episcopal Church website, there may be some information we can get there. All right, thanks. 
Okay, so um, this question says, do you think that the reparations committee is moving in the right direction? Because again, like I said, um, obviously we we have the committee, but we do want feedback. We want to hear from what you guys are thinking and you know what you're talking about when you're not at church. Um, so so feel free to to put your comment in the chat or raise your hand or just come off mute. I'm gonna go and try and see if I see anybody with a hand up. Okay, not so much. All right, so I guess again, I, I at least I, I guess I explained it well, but if you have questions later, you feel free to follow up with us, okay? All right, next slide. So um, this is actually, well, all of it was my favorite since I made this presentation, but I'm a, as a historian, I like looking at this slide. All right, so congregational history partners. This is sort of the next piece. I, I sort of touched on uh, parish histories earlier, but this group is headed up by Kathy O'Donnell and Franklin Robinson, and they meet once a month on the second Saturday at 10 a.m., I believe. So we know that some of you have done your parish histories, and that is awesome. But it also, we know that it's also sort of human nature to leave out the, the unsavory parts and focus on all the good stuff. You know, the stuff that kind of sets us apart and makes us feel special, like, ooh, Thurgood Marshall or Alma Thomas attended my church, or George Washington and James Madison were members at my church, right? So we understand that, but we invite you to go a little deeper. Is it really okay to say that your church doesn't have a quote unquote race problem? And then in the very next breath, say that your parish almost closed in the 1960s because of changing demographics. That is literally the definition of a race problem. Because if we're not willing to go out into the neighborhood and the communities to invite people in, then what are we doing? And that's true whether it happened in the 60s or last year. It's also true whether it's a predominantly white church or a majority black church. So congregational history partners is a safe space for you or the parish historians in your congregation to begin to explore your parish's history and share what they find among people who are on the same journey of discovery. Look into your past, look deeper into the lives of your parish's founding families. See what businesses sponsored your building campaigns and how those businesses or organizations made their money. Look into your historic and current outreach efforts. Over the years, has your parish actively tried to make disciples in the neighborhood the church is in? So we really wanna encourage you to make this a priority because understanding your parish's intersection with race is fundamental to understanding reparations. Examine the sacred vessels in your church. Do you know their provenance? Maybe a black church closed and your white church received its assets because yes, that did happen. Maybe the location of your parish was intentionally set in an all-white enclave. The truth is often hard and sometimes painful. And doing your history through the lens of race is like ripping off band-aids, like the big ones that you know half of you is going to be stuck to it once the adhesive comes off. But who knows? Maybe you'll discover that in the D.C. race, race riot of 1919 that your parish helped Black people who were being terrorized by white mobs. All of these stories deserve to be known because they tell us as a parish family where we've come from and where we can go from here. I'm a genealogist, so you may have noticed I do look at this as a, as a family. And just like with any family, you've got people who were literal saints and some who were outlaws. Most of our ancestors are likely somewhere in the middle, ordinary people who made good decisions sometimes and bad decisions sometimes, but they are our family and we don't love them any less. We just say, yeah, that happened. And then we do better. We use their stories to, to learn about the past so that it informs the present and the future. But either way, we can't be afraid of learning the truth. God hasn't given us a spirit of fear or cowardice as the NRSV puts it, but of love and love rejoices in the truth, whatever that truth might be. So we can't feel attacked when we're asked to critically examine our parish's past through the lens of race. Next slide. So this is a project that Franklin is working on, Franklin Robinson, who I mentioned earlier. Um, the Episcopal Diocese of Maryland was carved out. I'm oh, sorry, the Episcopal Diocese of Washington was carved out of the Diocese of Maryland. So he's writing a history of the eight original parishes in Maryland that became part of EDAO that go back to like the 16 and 1700s. Um, so if you recall, Anglican missionaries started coming to America, you know, early 1600s to convert Native Americans and Black people. And Black people typically worshiped in the balconies of these churches. So case in point, if your parish has a balcony or if the previous iteration of your parish had a balcony, you might want to look into that history. Okay, so I'm going to stop there talking about history because it's kind of my jam and I could go on forever. Next slide. 
So the committee is called to discern a way forward regarding reparations. The focus right now is on communicating with rectors and parishes, both to make sure that everyone understands why the committee was formed, its purpose, and also to start the engagement phase collecting data in the form of listening sessions and truth-telling events. This is about relationship building and it's a truth discovery process. We wanna collect stories about parishes that closed, what the circumstances were that led up to that, how assets were distributed, but also from individuals, clergy and lay members who experienced direct racism. So I heard a story recently about a lady who was attending a church and this happened some years ago. And then like a couple Sundays in the, the, the rector pulled her aside and said, well, some of the parishioners have an issue with you drinking from the same communion cup as everybody else. So, you know, it's stories like that that can cause real deep hurt. And it's just, that's not fun to hear. I'm sure it wasn't fun for her. And do you think that she stayed at that church? I mean, would you? So so those are the kinds of stories that we want to hear. Um, we want to make sure that we have a clear sense of harms that were done to inform any proposals that are made. Next slide. So I presented a pretty brief outline of the committee's work, um, the plans for that work. Was there? So the question is, was there anything specific that you're looking for, for this committee to do moving forward that was not presented? And whether or not you feel there are areas for more sensitivity. So I see some comments in the chat, so I'll, I'll read them. Um, Michael said, I think where the committee is going is a good start with the initial collecting of data and putting the word out. I hope it will continue and move into having the conversations as difficult as they may be. Thank you, that's what we hope too. Um, I'm gonna go through and see if I see any hands up, but you're always welcome to just sort of take yourself off mute and- Gigi, listen. Michelle Morgan has her hand up. Oh, I thank you. I was about to speak for myself, but thank you, Andrew. Hi, Gigi. Um, I really Hi. appreciate your um, presentation. And I have to say that I think, um, how do I wanna put this? Um, I've been pushing my archives committee to to look into our history, and I sort of stumbled across in the middle of a conversation. We sort of both had this dawning moment of, well, yeah, we know that um, enslaved people didn't build St. Mark's Capitol Hill, but where did the money come from, right? And it was just like, and I'm sure all this information is somewhere within all of this. And so we had a lengthy conversation about starting to look at some of the first families that really financially supported. And it's, it's a slog, right? It's a slog, but it's, um, it's been a while for us to get to the point of why, why we want to do this and to have buy-in on that. So it, it, it just, it's a weird, it's a weird thing because I think that we're so uncomfortable having conversations and as much as I would say, wouldn't it be great if the reparations committee came and did this presentation all around for not just us to see, but for like my archives committee to see. Um, there's also this weird thing about like, I don't really think I need people of color to come and do the emotional lifting for my mostly white congregation. So there's a, there's this weird thing about like, how do I ask for help without saying, um, hey, come and do this for me do you know what I mean? Like, I, I, I'm yeah, not really yeah. in the question. I'm just I, trying to get a frame of what this, this conversation is having me feel. And the silence to me is killing me because I think all of us, well, I'll speak for myself. I'm always terrified. I'm going to say the absolute wrong thing. And 31 people are going to go, oh my God, what, who is that person? And wow. You know? So I think it, it freezes it. We get frozen. I get frozen up. Maybe others do too. And I'll stop talking now. Well, Michelle, first, I just want to say thank you for your honesty. Um, I'm, I'm, my experience is that if one person feels it, they're not the only one. So I'm sure that there are other people who feel like they don't want to say something because they're afraid it'll be the absolute wrong thing. And, you know, they might get, uh, you know, kicked out of the, out of the Episcopal diocese or something, who knows. But I will say too, that, you know, those are common, this is where we are. We have to start having these conversations. So we all have to kind of you know, put on our big people pants and just and ask the hard questions and say what's on our minds because that's that's the only way we're going to be able to move forward. So, and I understand that you know maybe this particular forum is is you're not super comfortable doing it here, but um, my 
my next slide, actually, I think I, I go into, and there's only like one or two more, I promise. <laughs> But um, the next one, you know, we're, we're going to make ourselves available to talk to you guys. So if you want to follow up with me or Reverend Glenna or Erica or Rudy, Rudy, I told you I was going to throw you into this, so you shouldn't be surprised. These are the, obviously our staff liaison. But seriously, all of us are happy to kind of to have those conversations with you and your parish. Um, so so just, yeah, follow up with us, follow up with me and, and we'll figure out where to go forward. And that that goes for anybody on this call. All right. All right, um, next slide. So what was there, were there any other questions or comments? And and to your point, Michelle, about, you know, how do you get started on the history? I mean, yeah, we will, I, I wanna follow up with you and, and have that conversation because I have some ideas and it's kind of one of those things where, you know, some things you just have to try it and see if it works, but I think it'll work. All right, so I started um, this, oh yeah. Uh, this is Mary Levy um, from St. Andrews. We were we were established as a parish to be the parish that helped the University of Maryland. Are you saying that our research then should really encompass, you know, the racial practices and biases that that were really rampant in the early days of the university? Um, is is their history then our history too, that that has to be part of what we address? Well, I think you have to look at your parish and see where those intersections are, right? And if there if there are, you know, if the parish was was there to support the university, then it seems like there would be some spillover, right? So those are the things you want to look into for sure. And you you may find something, you may not. I mean, it's it's all just a matter of of doing the research. And that's to to Michelle's point, that is the hard slog. <laughs> um, you know, unless you're, you know, somebody like me or Franklin or Kathy who who, you know, love digging in archives and, you know, breathing dust, you know, it, it's it, I can't say it's the like, you know, the, the most fun thing, but it's extremely rewarding because you get a chance to see exactly where you come from as a parish and you understand, okay, well, this is why, you know, this might be the reason why things are the way they are right now, right? So I would just say that, you know, as you start doing the digging, you'll, I think it'll become pretty clear pretty quick, like what avenues you might wanna, you know, pull the string a little further, further and see where those intersections of, of, of race are there because I'm pretty sure they probably are. All right, any other questions or comments? Um, somebody said, um, oh, wow, well, there's all sorts of comments. Um, I don't know if I have time to read them. I feel like I'm already over my time. <laughs> but um, Angie, were you gonna say something? So I think you could read those two, but we do um, need to bring this part of the, the regional gathering to a close um, as soon as we can, so we can move on to the next item. Okay. All right. Well, I'll just, I'll, I'll paraphrase the, the comments. How about that? Some people said some really nice things. So thank you. I appreciate that. Um, and somebody said a comment that the comment here among the leaders of San Mateo is that they would really like the slide so that they can be digested, especially. Oh, sure. Yes. We will absolutely make the slides available. I don't think that's a problem. All right. And last thing, I promise. Um, someone said, generally thinking about slaveholding leaders and congregations some guidance for parishes that were founded in the mid 19th. You definitely want to catch up with Kathy. I'm telling you, go to those meetings, the Congregational History Partners. They are literally the experts on this subject because they've been studying this for a while. Um, so I would really encourage everyone who's interested in this on any level to go to the next Congregational History Partners meeting. All right, next slide, please. And then I think I should be done. <laughs> all right, yeah, so that's it. So I'm going to put all of our emails in the chat. So you can follow up with us and um, thank you all so much for having me. And I think that's it for me. So thank you. Yeah, I'll please join me in thanking Gigi for such a wonderful presentation and Gigi also for uh, your incredible leadership of this work on behalf of our diocese. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate it. I'm happy to do it. Y'all take care. All right. Bye. Good night. Bye. We'll pass it along for a discussion of our 2024 draft diocesan budget, and then we'll take a quick break after that. Great. Awesome. Well, thanks, John. Um, 
so good evening. My name is, uh, and apologies, I've got my my monitors up here to help read, read our, uh, our get, get in the specific details on this, the budget here. But but uh, for those of that I don't know, my name is Joe Alcock. I'm a member of St. Paul's Rock Creek in D.C. and serve as the chair of the Diocese and Finance Committee of the Diocese. I'm here to introduce the draft budget for 2024, but before going into the details of the budget, I'm going to say a few words about the budgeting process. This is going to provide a little bit more clarity to, to it, but so that, um, you know, you can really understand how this works. So um, as I'm talking, we will show the budget on the screen, and you can also find the budget using the link below posted in the chat. Um, as you're listening, if a question or comment comes to mind, please type it in the chat. So if you're really thinking about it, and even if you don't Think you want to ask that question? You should. Um, as you are listening, if a, you know, again, if something comes to mind, type in the chat because uh, this will enable us to have a good discussion about the budget um, once we're done with this presentation. And so, um, you know, the budget process again, as we explained, that begins towards the end of August when the bishop staff pursues a first draft based upon what they know about the year ahead. Throughout the fall, the budget goes through multiple revisions as is reviewed each month by the Diocesan Council and Finance Committee. The current draft of the budget is presented at all of the regional gatherings, just as we are doing right now. And this year, the current draft has also been sent to all parishes with the request that the vestries review the budget during an upcoming vestry meeting and submit feedback. The goal of the budgeting process is to ensure that we, as a diocese, are being good stewards of our financial resources and that the budget, when it is presented and adopted at diocesan convention in January, reflects the priorities laid out in the diocesan strategic plan. Now let's look at a draft budget in more detail. I will not be going into through every line item of the budget, but instead we'll be focusing on a few, few key points and line items. Again, as I'll say probably three more times during this meeting, if you have a question or comment, please put them in the chat. So we'll start first with the revenue. Um, as you can see, the budget has three columns. The first column on the left is the 2023 budget that was approved by the Diocesan Convention back in January. The second column, which is heading of the 2023 forecast, is the amended 2023 budget approved by Diocesan Council in June. And the third column is the current draft of the budget for 2024. Congr congressional giving is the largest source of revenue for the diocesan work and ministries. For 2023, pledges from congregations totaled 2.23 million, which you can see in the middle column. For 2024, congressional giving is budgeted to increase for a total, um, increase slightly for a total of 2.25 million. Income from the Soper Trust designated um, is designed to support the operating budget of the diocese. In 2024, the diocese will draw 4.6% of the three-year rolling average of the trust year-end balance. Income from the Soper Trust in 2024 is budgeted at 1.63 million. The closed parish fund consists of net proceeds from the disposition of real estate following the close of a parish. In 2006, Diocesan Council established a policy for how the funds would be used with one of the primary uses being the support of new church plans. In 2024, 193,000 from the closed parish fund will support Diocesan church planting efforts in Bowie, Maryland, including compensation for their church planter. Income from the Lilly Endowment Grant is designed is designated to support the Tending Our Soil Initiative. As of this fall, about one third of the Diocesan congr congregations are currently participating in Tending Our Soil. The Corton Education Fund was established by a generous bequest to the diocese with the purpose of supporting education initiatives at the discretion of the bishop. For 2024, 200,000 from the Corton Fund will support the work of the Church for Christian Faith and Leadership, including compensation for the school's director. And finally, the diocese, the diocese had funds designated to support Latino ministries. Those funds came from an Episcopal Church grant that we'd received in Dyson Reserves, but those funds will all be used by the end of the year, and so they will not provide any income in 2024. So turning to the expense side of the budget under church revitalization, with the establishment of a Black Church Ministry Committee to support a historical Black congregations, a new budget line item of 10000 has been added in the budget for the work of that committee. Unfortunately, the Congregational Grants Program will be phased out at the end of 2023 with no grants available in 2024. Congressional grants beginning, 
began prior to the pandemic as part of the bishop's encouragement that all congregations move toward tithing to diocesan work in ministries so that some income from the Sopertron Trust could be used for grants to congregations. As, congressional, as congregational giving has dropped over the last five years, and it's down almost 10% during that time, funding resources have also diminished. The Growing Young program ends in 2023 as originally scheduled, and therefore there's no budget allocated in 2023, 2024. Excuse me. Moving to the next slide. Um, at the very top, campus ministries uh, are currently undergoing a revision process and with no campus ministers at this time. Staffing costs are greatly reduced. For 2024, the budget for campus young adult ministers ministries is set at 50,000. A little further down under equity and justice, there's a line item for the reparations committee. The reparations committee, as we just discussed, was formed by a resolution passed at the Diocesan Convention back in January 23. The committee has started their work and will continue forward in 2024. The committee budget is now set at 30,000. Under national and inter international and international ministries, you will see a line item for T the Episcopal Church, which is an, or TEC, which is an acronym for the Episcopal Church. Giving to the Episcopal Church will continue at the 15% level as required with a budget of 529,000. At the very bottom of this slide, you will see one line item for salaries and benefits. This represents a significant change in the presentation format from prior, from prior years. Um, in the past, salaries and benefits for the Dyson staff were allocated across ministry areas, depending on how staff members spent their time. However, based upon feedback, especially from me, um, that format was confusing. So this year, there's just one line item uh, for all Dyson staff and uh, salaries and benefits. Um, so again, that's a big one that I think where if you're looking at prior, prior um, breakouts of the budget, you would have seen it in different buckets and there would have been allocations. But I, for me, I, I feel like this is really uh, a really clear way of looking at it. And I'm really excited that this is going to help us really see, see where the funds are being spent. But moving forward, for, so as it relates to salaries and benefits, for 2024, the bishop, three canons, and the archdeacon will not receive a cost of living increase. The administrative staff and missioners are budgeted to receive a 2% increase, while two new staff who started in September of 2023 will receive a 1% increase. These increases are less than, the, than what the Human Resource Committee recommended for clergy and lay employees across the diocese, but all that, but all that the current budget will allow. So again, I, I think that's key to, oops, apologies, I'm running out of power here. I think that's a key item to uh, keep in mind here. Oh, sorry, um, that the um, sorry almost ran out. Uh, Joe, while you're trying oh, to yeah. get while you're trying to get your your power yeah. working, I see that <laughs> Milana has her hand up. Right. And so, Milana, do you want to ask a question? And that'll give Joe some time to get his power going. Thanks. Sure. Um, so the difference 2023 to 2024 for total diocesan ministries is a, is a large difference. I'm wondering whether having the salaries and benefits down in a group at the bottom uh, accounts for or balances out the difference that we see at on the ministry's line item. Yes, that's correct, Milana. If you looked at the three sections that make up total diocesan ministries, those three sections being church revitalization, faith and leadership, and equity and justice, there's a drop in the budget for all three of those. And that's because we have pulled out salaries and benefits from those sections and put it into one separate line item. So you're exactly right. Right. And I think that was the the last part. So so yeah, apologies about that, guys. I thought I didn't have power and you know, um, I'm in the middle of a move. So we're kind of working through some things. So so I appreciate that there. Um but but kind of just kind of going back to the list. So kind of to I think because that's a, kind of a key point I think of this this presentation is the the salaries and benefits um, that were approved or specifically the salaries 
that the the you know there's the the bishop the three canons and the archdeacon will not receive a cost of living increase for 2024 and then also the the majority of the staff is going to receive uh, a cola adjustment less than what was recommended by the human resource uh, committee but again this is this is what the budget will allow with the the resources that we have given to us um i think we just mentioned this a little bit but kind of this is the next part of the, the script is you will notice that the salaries and benefit costs have increased from 2023 to 2024. This increase reflects the hire of three new diocese staff members during 2023. Two of these positions, the church planner for Bowie and the director of the school for Christian faith and leadership are funded by designated resources. And the third position an administrative assistant is partially funded by the Lilly endowment grant. All three of these positions are instrumental in fulfilling key priorities of the diocesan strategic plan. The next slide has the general administrative expenses. So I'm not gonna go into much detail here, um, but just you can review the slide um, you know, and, and kind of, uh, you know, just basically this one is any changes to under general administrative have been made to reflect actual costs. Um, a lot of sm smaller items that uh, make up the overall general administrative part of our budget. Um, but go ahead and take a look through here. If you, uh, you know, again, if anything comes up, you can definitely uh, put that in the chat. I think we can go to the next one. So this next one here, this is, the uh, governance and communication. So the real significant change in, in 2024 is, is that, that this is a general convention year. And therefore we have budgeted for expenses related to our participation at general convention. At the bottom right corner of the slide, you will see this current draft of the budget shows a deficit of 22,000 or 21,588 to be specific. But this deficit will be eliminated as the budget continues to be revised and a balanced budget will be presented at Dyson convention in January. So I hope this overview has been helpful. At least it was a little exciting with my uh, computer about to give out. Um, but but we really do hope this has been been helpful um, in giving you a general understanding of how the, the budget's prepared um, and just kind of what we're, plans are for 2024. So please do ask your vestries to review the budget at an upcoming meeting and send any feedback to Canon or Andrew Walter. Um, and with that, Andrew and I would be happy to ask any questions or answer any questions, I guess. Um, and I see that um, Todd was um, just asking for some clarification that there will be no um, congregational grants for um, 2024. And that's correct, Todd. There will be no grants um, available in 2024. So I think then- Deb And Debbie has... Sun. Debbie, um, Debbie, we did include notes with the budget that was circulated to um, clergy and wardens. So they have that to share with their vestries. And Bob has a question. What do the, the parking line item cover, um, staff parking? Andrew, do you want to take that one on the GNA? Sure, that's exactly what it covers. It covers um, parking for staff. Um, we uh, we use the parking garage uh, at the cathedral and we get billed for that. Helen, maybe you could just stop sharing the screen. Thank you. I just want to see everyone's faces. Hi, friends. It's good to see you. Um, I do want us to move on. I'm watching the time, but... Um, are there any other questions? If you if you have a question or a comment, please just maybe now just raise your hand. We'd love to hear from you. Um, it's really important that we all engage um, in a conversation around uh, our our diocesan budget because it's our budget. Michelle. So, by not meeting COLA, it's not really just the bishop and the missioners who are not having a pay raise, they're actually taking a cut in their pay because the COLA is based on inflation. And I just want to say that out loud. I know we all know that, but sometimes when we say, oh, we're not meeting the COLA that was recommended is we're really actually asking the entire diocese and staff to take a pay cut. Thank There's you. not a question. Most 
making a statement. No, that's that's true. Thank you. Anyone else? Is um, ta uh, Todd is ag is um, the ag ag Agnes Dunn Fellowship still funded? Yes. So we have an Agnes Dunn Fund, and that um, that's a separate designated fund, and there are still funds available. As I remember, that provides um, assistance for clergy education, um, continuing education. There are still funds there. Um, Andrew, may I say something? Especially? Please, of course. Um, and I think it, it may be a point of clarification. The, uh, there are other funds available for congregation and clergy in the diocesan assets. What we started about five years ago, maybe now, maybe a little longer, maybe seven, maybe seven years ago now, was at a time, this was pre-pandemic, when, um, as as John, as Joey said, I was encouraging congregations to consider moving toward the minimum, the, the tithe of commitment to the diocese, investment in the diocese, which would free up resources that we have from our endowments to fund the diocese to, to, to allow us to do some specific grants targeted for congregational growth. And that unfortunately is the part because diocesan giving has declined. Um, and it's not clear that we'll, you know, I think actually the budget reflected a decline, Joe, not an increase in diocesan in, in the in the numbers for diocesan giving. We're just we're trying to recognize that congregations are struggling right now. And that um, even maintaining a, a commitment that congregations were making earlier for some is just a real struggle. And so uh, we recognize that. And we also recognize that giving to the diocese is voluntary. And so we don't have any enforcement mechanisms. And so that was the, as, as sad as that is, that was the one place that we, um, we couldn't, you know, it was a, it was a, it was a project that we started a few years ago, but it wasn't one that we can sustain without the commitment of income coming from the other side. So. Thank you, Mary. Yeah. Helpful. Yeah. Um, but there is still money in the budget for emergencies. There's money in the budget for, you know, other, you know, there's other funds. It's not like there's no money going towards congregations. It's just that particular one that's been phased out. Thank you, Marianne. So friends, please, um, as clergy and wardens and delegates, um, uh, I did send the budget and accompanying notes to clergy and wardens. Please um, take a little time at your next vestry meeting to discuss it and send me some feedback. We'd love to hear from you by the end of November. Because it's a lot that, easier. It's a lot easier to make right. changes to the budget before we get to diocesan convention than it is on the floor of convention. And so if, if you have a vestry member or members who really are wanting to have us change something, this is really the time um, and, and we're all ears. Yeah, I'll emphasize that again. Now is the time, so please, thank you. Um, John and Milana, back to you. Yeah, well, everyone, please join me. It's time for our break. Yeah, and Andrew and everyone for their really great work on this. Yes, thank you, Jill and Andrew. Bishop uh, and Andrew, we're running about seven minutes over. So how long of a break would y'all like for us to take? Why don't we, I I see 742 on my computer. Why don't we come back at 750? So sort of about eight minute break. That sounds good. Thank you. Thanks, friends. Thanks, everyone. Uh, next up on our agenda is that we're going to break out uh, into our regions. And so, uh, Alan, I think you were going to put up on our screens a way for us to choose which breakout room to go into. Is that correct? Yes. Are there any instructions we should follow with that? I see we can choose breakout rooms at the bottom. Is that right? Correct. You uh, put yourself into your region's breakout. Okay. 
So if you go to the bottom, click on breakout rooms, you can choose North Prince George's or South DC. We'll be there for about 25 minutes. Thanks, Alan. Welcome. Gratitude. I hope the South DC meeting was fruitful and enjoyable. I really loved being with the North Prince George's County conversation, but I think it's time for us to say our prayers and um, bring this conversation to a close. All right, thank you. Milana, will you get us started? You might unmute yourself, Milana. According to the promise of our God, bloom will come from the desert. Justice, righteousness, reconciliation, peace, and joy are coming. God, the giver of life, whose Holy Spirit wells up within your church, by the Spirit's gifts, equip us to live the gospel of Christ. Make us eager to do your will. That we may share with the whole creation the joys of eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you. In the unity of the Holy Spirit. One God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Bishop, would you offer us your, offer us your blessing? And I'm honored to. Um, may you um, leave this gathering and go into your evening in peace. And may the blessing of God Almighty, our creator, our sustainer, and our redeemer go with you and remain with you this day, this night, and always. Amen. Thank you so much. Amen. Everyone. Blessings. Thank you, John. Thank you, Milana, Thank you. presenters. So, so good to be with you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thank good you. Night.